Welcome to Science with Sanjula, where we talk about anything global health. My name is Sanjula Singh, and I am a researcher at the University of Oxford. Join me as I speak to world-leading scientists who tackle today's biggest challenges in healthcare. I am delighted to introduce our guest of today's podcast episode, which is Professor Neri Woods. Thank you so much for coming in today. Could you please explain to us what your function is at the University of Oxford? So I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government here at Oxford. I'm actually the founding Dean. So I started the project of building the school 12 or 13 years ago. Wow, it's been such a long time already. Mm. And how did that project came to be? Well, from my point of view, the project came to be because the then vice chancellor um, suggested to me that if I wanted a new challenge, I should build Oxford a public policy school. That's quite a challenge, though. Yeah. I think let, let's dive into really the topic of t- today's podcast. I think what many people don't realize is the importance of governance for global health policies all over the world. I think a good example is that the British Medical Journal, one of the most prominent journals worldwide, they released a poll in 2007 to talk about the most important medical milestones ever since it was first published in 1840. And the answer was sanitation. It was not antibiotics, it was not vaccination, it was really public policy done well. Mm-hmm. You, having worked in, in governance for so many years, do you feel like you have become a little bit of an expert on health yourself? My area of expertise is most definitely governments and governance. What strikes me about health is that so many of the great medical inventions of the last couple of hundred years are still not reaching more than a few percentage of the world's population. You've got literally, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of diabetics in the United States that are not getting treatment for diabetes. That was a fantastic invention. The big challenge, I think, for medics and for schools of government alike is to find ways to ensure that all people get access to those medical treatments. You sometimes say governance and sometimes you will say government. Yeah. Are those two different entities? Oh, absolutely. So by government, I mean um, the elected or appointed officials that lead a country's government and all those who work in the public service funded by the revenues of the government. So public revenues, that's a public purpose. Governance means the set of arrangements that bring different stakeholders together. So in a governance arrangement, if you're trying to govern sanitation, You've probably got charities, people from the local community that dig wells. You've got farmers. You've got, um, you know, mothers. You've got churches. You've got the government. uh, You've got private sector companies. And a governance arrangement is one that can include all of those. It doesn't always, but it can. I was wondering if you could please share your thoughts on a concept called philanthrocapitalism, which gets to philanthropists setting up their own organizations um, to improve global health, the Gates Foundation being a prime example. And what do you think about the role of these organizations in comparison to the roles of governments worldwide? So the, Ga- the Gates Foundation has done some really important research and funded research um, and really important initiatives. When philanthropists decide to focus on a particular disease or a particular kind of research, they're completely within their rights to do so. They're, they're using their own funding. Uh, when they're using tax deductions and tax funding, we need to actually stop and think, whose priority is this and whose priority should it be? And who is it that can be held to account for building that priority? So if a, if a country like Vietnam decides that the biggest killer of its population is road safety, um, should it be the case that Vietnam's own resources are deployed on road safety? Or should it be the case that Vietnam's own resources end up being deployed by the, the passion and the priority of a global philanthropist? That's a difficult question. There's a lot of thoughtful people in the Gates Foundation who think about that question and who who engage with governments to find out and to understand their priorities. But it, it still remains a vexing question across this this these partnerships between philanthropists, global health organizations and governments. 
I think most of the world would think if only uh, the philanthropists would solve the problem to the degree that governments weren't um, necessary. But the trouble is uh, government is unavoidable on health. Um, If you're trying to deal with maternal mortality, you need good roads so that you can get a woman in childbirth in urgent need of medical attention rapidly to a clinic. Who should build the roads? Is it the philanthropist? Is it the hospital? Is it the private citizens? Is it the government? In the end, although social entrepreneurs and philanthropists do great work, it's very difficult to avoid the importance of government because it's government that can most effectively provide the public goods that make everything else possible. If we zoom into government a little bit more, for example, about ministries of health or ministers of health. Do you think it's a positive aspect if that person is a health professional? Look, I I think it is um, really important to have health professionals um, because they will bring an understanding of the health professionals that their policies are going to affect. But it's also vital that those health professionals or the health minister can have a conversation with the Minister of Finance in her country so that together they can work on a health strategy. And what I see in too many countries is two silos. There's a silo where the health professionals are all talking and they, you know, there's always a risk that they're medicalizing the, the problems. They're building ambulances and healthcare at the bottom of the cliff instead of working with government to build fences at the top of the cliff. And sometimes those fences are not at all medical, you know, as you've just pointed out. Sometimes it's about ensuring safe drinking water. It's about um, ensuring good roads. Um, it's about ensuring that there's enough money in the hands of families to to nourish their children so that malnourishment doesn't cause stunting in early life. So those are, those are all really important elements that are not always within the purview of the health minister. Right. right. I, I completely agree. And... Um, Could you illustrate an example, a real-life example of that that you have encountered yourself? You know, a couple of decades ago, I brought the Ministers of Health and the Ministers of Finance to a meeting in Oxford. And it was during the HIV-AIDS epidemic, which was causing the loss of millions of lives across every continent. And in developing countries was extraordinarily difficult. And the problem was this. It's that the ministers of health said, if we don't put millions and millions of dollars into testing and treating AIDS victims, millions of people will die. And the finance ministers said the exact opposite. They said, if we try to inject millions of millions of dollars into these countries with good intentions, we're actually going to cause a lot of death because these countries can't absorb all that money. So the money is going to be wasted. It's going to it's going to lead to huge amounts of corruption, the wrong expenditures, and it's going to leave the country in debt. And each of them had a point. And the point of the meeting I hosted here in Oxford was to find the middle path between them. It was to get the finance ministers to really think about how do we improve the absorptive capacity? In other words, how do we improve the capacity of a community to take those dollars and turn them into better healthcare outcomes for AIDS victims and others. And to the ministers of health, how do we sequence this so that it has the effects that you want? Then there was a quote that you made, I think, last year at the World Economic Forum. You said, the good news is that elites across the world trust each other more and more so we can come together and design and do beautiful things together. The bad thing is that in every single country they were polling, the majority of people trusted their elite less. So we can lead, but if people aren't following, we're not going to get where we want to go. Yeah, so that quote's been misquoted so much, it's extraordinarily annoying to me because my point in the broader debate um, that I was speaking in was about trust. And it's that, and my starting point is that human beings need need a lot of trust with each other in order to do great things. And I was speaking to a group that were the elite and saying to them, look, it's fine. It's all fine and good that you trust each other and therefore you can do beautiful things together. But the world is in crisis because the majority populations of countries do not trust you, the elite. And that was my point. 
Could you please elaborate on the role of trust of people in its government during the pandemic? So at the at the Blavatny School of Government, um, my colleagues Tom Hale and Anna Petherick have run the Oxford Government Response Tracker. So they've been tracking what every government did uh, from the beginning of COVID right through, and they've been also tracking levels of trust, um, you know, that that ensued. And what's interesting is that in some countries, trust in government increased. Uh, Greece, uh, New Zealand, in that first period of COVID. Um, and in other countries, trust dissipated because it was felt that governments were not responding effectively. And COVID really highlights why we have government. Um, you know, government is annoying to most human beings and it <laughs> always fails to work in the way that people would like. But the reason human beings have government is because otherwise, in the famous words of Hobbes, life is nasty, brutish and short. If you every time you walk out your house, you have to think that somebody might mug you for your for your purse, that you're unsafe to leave your house, that um, that, the you know, there is no road that's publicly maintained, that your children can't go to a school that has a minimum standard of education. These are all things we take for granted. And I think in wealthy countries, we think about a lot of what government does almost in the same way that we put a plug into the wall and we turn on the electricity and we don't even think about how extraordinary it is that electricity flows. Right. Um, in I'm always struck in Silicon Valley by the number of techno-libertarians who think that life would be better with no government and we should just all use online polling to run our societies um, or indeed just have no government. Um, and one is always tempted to take them to a war zone where there is no government in operation and say, well, try it out. See if it's the nirvana you hope it is. Right. And very often it's not, I would say. Absolutely. And in covid in that first phase of COVID, when we didn't understand the virus, nobody understood the virus, but it was clear that it could be a very serious virus, societies needed everybody to show restraint. And that's not obvious. If everybody thinks, well, if everybody else is going to show restraint, I may as well break all the rules, then everybody can end up breaking the rules. It's a very simple point. But in order to shape human behavior, Humans act according to how they believe everybody else will act. And if humans believe that everybody else will show some discipline and self-control, they too will show more discipline and self-control. And that's why we need gov a government that can say, actually, we're asking everybody to show self-control. And then it can protect everybody. How can we deal with an increased globalization, not only in governments, but also in healthcare governance, when a virus, they don't know borders between countries, obviously, it, it spreads everywhere. Do you have any particular thoughts about that? It's really, really important. I mean, to show why we need to think about globalization and health. Um, one example is, you know, I wrote about the wealthy countries being super spreaders of COVID. Um, after the first year, when we started getting some of the um, evidence about where the infection was spreading to and from. And so Anna Petherick and I wrote a piece showing that most of the infections in New York and Europe were spread from New York and Europe, not from China. Now, my point in saying that is to say that I don't think anybody had really thought through how is it that we need to test people before they get on aeroplanes? And the minute we knew that there was COVID in Europe in those Italian ski resorts very early on, what kind of controls did we put on not putting people on aeroplanes where they spread the infection very quickly, including to very poor countries? So if we're going to, you know, we, we need to protect ourselves, we also need to protect those who have far less capability than than ourselves to continue to contain, treat, and prevent, you know, disease. And what are ways in practice to do that? So interestingly, at one point, China did begin to test everybody before they got on airplanes. And of course, that became a norm much further into the pandemic, actually, when the pandemic had become, you know, less serious because of the marvel of vaccinations. But... Um, I think there's so many lessons from COVID that we can learn moving forward. But 
in order to make those lessons a reality, we're going to need better global cooperation. And what are ways to obtain that larger global cooperation? So we, we, you know, the world has been trying to cooperate on health for a couple of hundred years, the international sanitary conferences and such like, that we're trying to, uh, um, without global cooperation, you get every tr- country trying to create a cordon sanitaire, trying to just keep everybody out in order to keep infection out. But of course, you don't just have to keep people out. You end up having to keep all foodstuffs, everything you import. You know, you, you cut off your lifeblood. And we saw some of this um, during COVID, how much countries rely on both trade and the movement of people with other countries. So you need, you need cooperation to create a set of rules which makes it safe for countries to do that. And that's what the modern World Health Organization is trying to do. It's trying to create and uphold a set of rules that say to countries, look, if you have a dangerous disease in your borders, notify us so that we can all take cooperative measures to protect each other. Now, the one thing the World Health Organization can't do if a country comes and notifies it is uh, is say to the world, right, you know, China's notified a disease. Everybody immediately stop all contact with China. Because if the World Health Organization does that, no country will ever come and notify a disease. They'll just hide it. Right, right. So it's this delicate balance between creating a set of rules and a mechanism that countries trust enough to come to, to notify of the disease, and to trust that they will then be able to work with other countries to manage that disease and not just become instantly punished. We've seen this over and over again in COVID when... when South Africa notified its variant because of its excellent testing regime. Um, it immediately got labelled the South African variant and countries started taking measures against South Africa. That is completely contrary to what is required, which is for countries to do what South Africa did, to come forward early, to share their information so that the world can then take cooperative measures to deal with it. But this is very misunderstood and politicians have been terrible in spreading that misunderstanding. And you think it's the responsibility of the politicians to spread that word throughout their own nation? So first we need politicians to really understand why cooperation is vital. We need them to understand the sacred compact of trust, which means that even a very poor country that has a dangerous disease will come forward and notify because they can always hide that information. They need to understand that and they need to be able to communicate it clearly to their populations so that a country doesn't get instantly blamed for coming forward. And um, and then they need to work cooperatively together on actions to contain the, the, the disease. People expect a lot of the World Health Organization. It, get, it, it gets hugely criticized. They forget that the entire budget of the World Health Organization is less than that of a very large hospital in the United States. And yet we're expecting this organization to do surveillance of disease right across the world and to create these mechanisms which make it safe for countries to come forward. Right, because I think some of the most loud criticisms are that the World Health Organization is sometimes a bit slow in their response and it may be too bureaucratic to get things done effectively and efficiently. Yes, I mean, one thing that, you know, we can guarantee is that in any outbreak of a disease, the World Health Organization will be hugely criticized. But that's because both sides have reason to criticize it. Um, Dealing with global infections is a little bit like trying to deal with a gun amnesty. You want people to come forward and bring their guns or their knives. Um, And if suddenly the police say, well, actually, we're going to arrest you for having that, the amnesty will stop working immediately. Nobody will show up. The police may (laughs) an arrest. Everyone will hide their guns and knives at home. And in that similar way, a country that's got an infection needs to feel safe to come forward and say, we've got this infection, knowing that it will then get support from the international community rather than be treated like a pariah. Right. So again, I think this notion of trust is so important here that people trust an organization to deal with that information in a safe and fair manner. And the trouble for the World Health Organization is it needs, we all need it to be trusted by every single country in the world, which is why if it kowtows entirely to the United States or entirely to China so that all other countries don't trust it, then it can't do its job. It's got to be 
equally trusted or perhaps sometimes equally mistrusted by all governments. It's got to find that equilibrium where although it's being criticised by governments, nevertheless, it has enough trust from all governments that they'll notify it of disease. I think I would like to move on to the last subject of this podcast, and that is on leadership and on female leadership. I think you are a role role model for so many people, for myself as well. Who are your role models when you were younger? I'm not sure that I've ever focused on role models. You know, that said, I think it's been, I think it's really, it's been important for me and it's important for all young women to have female teachers, female professors, to see females in, in leadership roles as a simple kind of, implicit role modeling in that that's very important and that I don't underestimate. But it's not always a conscious thing. It's not, oh, that person is my role model. It's a much it's a much deeper thing about, oh yeah, they can do that. And it's true for all identities. It's not just for, you know, gender. It's true for for minorities. It's true for anybody that feels that they have an ident- identity that other people notice. Um, needs to be able to see that people of that identity can be in leadership roles. It it lifts aspiration. And perhaps you've already said it, but at the end of every podcast episode, we always ask for your personal and for your professional advice um, for young professionals who aim for a career in in, in government or in governance. Mm-hmm. Um, what would that be? It's two things. In order to work out what you want to do, make sure you've really listened to the people that it will affect and that are going to be part of that journey. Make sure you've really listened to them. It will make your purpose better and stronger. And then in achieving it, really learn how to work with others. Really learn how to make it fun for other people to work with you um, and, and fun for them to work with each other because that's how humans do their best work. I think that's a beautiful and perfect ending. Thank you so much for being here today. It's a pleasure. Next week, we'll be joined by Professor Sir Peter Horby and we'll be talking about infectious diseases, his time overseas and the recovery trial on COVID.